just chill for a couple of minutes more because this is just only okay. around 80 people right now including okay. all of us uh, so uh just just for a couple of minutes what do you say tarikul i think yes yes because they have a class till 1 o'clock uh, yeah right. so if they can uh, we'll just wait for about a minute or two then we'll start yeah. you let me know yeah sure no mr vita thank you I think we should go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mr. Banerjee, uh, Mr. Peter, if you are ready, we can go ahead. So, good afternoon, students. Um, we have Mr. Peter back with us with Davis Knowledge, and today we will be talking about fortified wine. All yours, Mr. Peter. Great. So, uh, welcome everyone. Great to be back with you in the virtual classroom. Let me, oh, um, let me just uh, press the right button because this is the wrong one. Sorry. Um, to share the screen i almost managed to leave by mistake um okay so that's better that's sharing as uh, as planned and let us just get this to the proper size and um as the introduction um uh, uh contained uh it's uh, sherry and vermouth today so we are moving on to fortified wines and uh today we are going to spend uh quite a bit of uh, time with understanding uh, the uh, Spanish fortified uh, sherry, as well as then uh, covering a bit about vermouth and aromatized uh, wines. So without further delay, uh, let us just have a, a quick recap that during the winemaking session, we uh, really focused on understanding how still wines are made. You will also be uh, having a, a dedicated session uh, with Keith uh, to um, deal with sparkling wines and uh, in specific uh, quite a bit with uh, champagne. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we are uh, today and tomorrow uh, focusing on the details of fortified wines. When we look at fortified wines, uh, we may actually uh, group them into two larger uh, segments. Those uh, which are produced with uh, um, the addition of alcohol once the fermentation, uh, when the fermentation is still ongoing. So this is when we, so to say, arrest the fermentation or stop the fermentation uh, from fully completing. And this is uh, uh, port wines and Madeira. And those wines where uh, the uh, fermentation has completed uh, is uh, sherry. And this is what we are going to talk about today. So uh, first, we uh, have a, a quick historical uh, journey across uh, time, so you can appreciate uh, where uh, the production of grape and the culture of uh, wine uh, comes from in the region of Jerez, which is the southernmost uh, wine growing region in Europe. As you will see from the map, it's very, very close to North Africa. Uh, it's just really across the Strait of Gibraltar that the new continent starts. So it was the Phoenicians who approximately 3,000 years ago started to cultivate the grapes in the Cadiz uh, region, um, uh, which is very close to uh, Jerez. 
and later on uh, during the uh, um, time of the Greeks, the Carthaginians, as well as the Romans, uh, when Iber the Iberian Peninsula was part of the Roman Empire, uh, grapes were grown and uh, wine was produced, as we know it from uh, some uh, written uh, written uh, reminders, as well as uh, artifacts uh, such as uh, mosaics and paintings, as you can see, wine, uh, vine leaves, grape stomping. So uh, the um, real interest for us uh, from a Sherry perspective starts uh, around the uh, very beginning of the 8th century when um, the Iberian Peninsula was uh, conquered by uh, the uh, Arabs and the Islamic culture was brought uh, to what is uh, Spain uh, today. And uh, with this, a, a flourishing period of, of culture and uh, history uh, started. Uh, very highly sophisticated in science, uh, art, um, uh, the Arabic culture, as well as architecture. Now, the land of Sherish uh, was, uh, was controlled by the, um, the uh, Arabs uh, for about 500 years, and the production of, uh, or the growing of grapes was not um, stopped, but uh, actually was diverted for the production of sultanas, and raisins, as well as they used it for distillation purpose, because they were infusing various herbs and medicinal roots uh, into alcohol for medical purposes. It was not the consumption of alcohol, as we know, uh, consumption of alcohol is not allowed uh, for uh, uh, within Islam. So uh, wine consumption uh, was uh, really uh, taking off again uh, once the uh, reconquest took place in the 13th century. So in other words, the uh, Christian, uh, um, uh, Christians have taken back the Iberian Peninsula from uh, the control of the Arab conquerors. And uh, that, that was a time when Jerez de la Frontera gained a significant role as a uh, border between the two worlds, between Christian Europe and uh, uh, the uh, Islamic um, Muslim uh, North Africa. Uh, so if we look at the development of uh, the names of uh, today's uh, Heres, the city, uh, it used to be called Xera, Seret, and then the Arabic uh, Sherish. So that's where the um, uh, heritage is of uh, Heres de la Frontera. And as you can see, the word Sherish uh, uh, Hareth uh, comes actually from these words, and that that what gives the name for the drink as well. In fact, the Spanish call the wine Vino de Jerez, and it's in English that we call it Sherry wines. The expansion um, of uh, the uh, of the Spanish uh, kingdom across uh, the conquest of um, uh, of uh, land in South America. Uh, uh, really uh, guided and also the geographical exploration uh, really necessitated that uh, Cadiz and Jerez became a major ports and the ships had to be um, stocked with, uh, with uh, you know, food and also uh, wine simply because uh, at the time, uh, remind yourself, there was no uh, tap water, there was no filtered bottled water whatsoever. Else. So why, uh, water was uh, very difficult uh, uh, in terms of the drinking quality and wine was, uh, it was a habit to add wine to water uh, to increase the uh, pH level and the acidic uh, content would uh, deal with bacteria, so would make, wa uh, would make water consumable without uh, any, advan uh, any disadvantage. So uh, there was always wine in the cargo of the ships because uh, seafarers had to be able to uh, drink. It was really in the 19th century that uh, sherry uh, wine as we know it today started to develop. Initially, as I said, seafaring uh, nations uh, you know, going across the equator, South America, America, as well as, uh, uh, as uh, Southeast Asia, uh, they had to travel across the equator, sometimes multiple times uh, that they had to cross it. The, 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 the travel was treacherous uh, and, and the conditions were nothing close to what we agreed in terms of ideal storage condition for wine. 
uh, in terms of being dark, uh, constant temperature, so it was uh, the, the liquid was moving up and down as the uh, hulk of the ship was moving. It was uh, variable temperature, sometimes very high uh, and, uh, and really uh, unsuitable for uh, keeping wine uh, to a good quality. So therefore, fortification came in to stabilize <coughs> wines and make them uh, suitable for uh, consumption. And uh, in the 19th century, this uh, gave way to the rise of wine that was actually purposefully produced as a fortified wine because of its style and not only because of the stabilization aspect anymore. As such, families uh, emerged as primary producers of uh, sherry wine. Some of these names will be still known from big brands, Domecq, Barbadillo, Gonzalez Villas, uh, Willem and Hubert, uh, Umbert uh, will be uh, all uh, well-known sherry bodegas still today. The end of the 19th century brought phylloxera uh, the same way to Spanish vineyards and the vineyards of Jerez as to other parts of Europe. Phylloxera is a small bug that um, uh, is uh, getting onto the roots of uh, vines and uh, uh, lives on the sap of the uh, vines and thereby kills the vineyards very slowly but surely, uh, was uh, decimating uh, European vineyards. Jerez uh, relatively quickly recovered from the devastation of the vineyards and it was at this time that the primary grape varieties that we know today uh, were established for the production of uh, sherry wines. Later in the, uh, uh, so in the 19th century also, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, move, uh, mo movement to uh, protect and to promote the protection of uh, geographical indication so that the identity of, uh, of a wine would be uh, protected uh, and, and would be associated with one particular region. And it was in the Paris Agreement uh, that the first denomination of origins were uh, agreed. Following on that, the uh, creation of the DOs, or denomination of origins, took place. And uh, in the 1930s, the first Spanish wine law was established. The uh, first DO in Spain, in fact, was uh, the uh, DO of uh, Jerez. And it was in 1935 that uh, this was created. Along with that came the regulatory body of the wines of Jerez, and this is the Consejo Regulador. About the role of the Consejo Regulador plays in the life of sherry producers, we are going to talk in a second. So, first looking at uh, the actual geographical area, uh, the uh, Zona de Crianza has uh, three main areas. One is the heart of sherry production, and this is in and around Jerez de la Frontera, as you can see it on the map. The second uh, is uh, San Luca de Barrameda, which is slightly northwest on the Atlantic coast of uh, Spain. And then uh, uh, southwest of, from Jerez is El Puerto de Santa Maria. These are the uh, three important zones of uh, Crianza, and uh, in between the three points lies uh, the uh, Sherry region. This covers an approximate 7,000 hectares of vineyard land. In terms of uh, deals, there are three deals uh, in Jerez. One is dedicated to uh, the uh, wines of Jerez, so to Sherry wines. The second one is dedicated to Manzanilla, which is a fino produced in San Luca di Barrameda. We are going to cover that in detail, how it differs from fino. And the third DO is for vinegar. So three DOs, sherry, Manzanilla, and vinegar. In terms of uh, understanding uh, and uh, being able to appreciate the sherry wine market, it's good to have a look at the uh, global production. So sherry is produced only in Spain. Uh, it's about 46 million bottles that is produced per uh, year. And uh, the consumption is pretty much concentrated in three countries. The primary consumer of sherry wines is uh, Spain itself, 
with a bit more than a third of the sherries being sold and consumed in Spain. The other two major uh, consuming countries include Great Britain as well as the Netherlands. And then the remaining countries such as Germany, the United States, Belgium, France, Canada, uh, Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, uh, make up very, very small amount and very small share that they represent. As you may suspect, the underlying message is that this style of wine is very much associated with certain consuming countries. And unfortunately, the 20th century has seen a massive decline in the consumption of, of sherry, which is pretty much associated with the uh, disappearance of a consumer segment uh, that I will cover later when we come to blended sherries. However, the, what is exciting about sherry today is that there is a, a true renaissance and revival of the dry sherries, which, uh, which are really uh, uh, great for gastronomy, for pairing with uh, food. Unfortunately, you don't see India on the map, uh, on this uh, graph here, and it is also an indication that uh, over the past 15 years I've been traveling to India, I have not really seen much sherry, so I hope that when you do get the chance to taste sherry, you will live with it because uh, it's, it's a rare commodity in the uh, Indian gastronomic uh, scene. So I have mentioned that the Consejo Regulador, the industry body regulating and maintaining the quality as well as responsible for the promotion of sherry wines, has a number of duties to fulfill. The first one is that it provides what they call the technical files, or in other words, the technical specifications of how sherry needs to be produced. This includes both viticulture, which uh, covers uh, such, uh, such uh, particularities as uh, where the vineyards may be located, uh, how to, uh, what varieties may be, con uh, may be planted, how to tend the vineyard, viticultural practices that are allowed, harvest dates and conditions, and so on. They also focus on the wine production side through technical advice, in which they set out the maximum uh, amount of uh, wine uh, that can be produced uh, from uh, a certain amount of grapes, so that's 70 liters per 100 kilos. They describe the process of vinification, aging requirements, uh, any specificities about the oak uh, and uh, this different styles, what the expectations are. Sherry is very much a style-driven drink rather than vintage or vineyard-driven. The Consejo Regulador also uh, approves uh, each bottle with a seal of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the organization to show that this wine is a genuine sherry produced in the Hereth region. Let us now take a into the great so uh, Spain and Portugal without the borders and as you can see the southernmost uh, trip is uh, as, as I pointed out I don't know if the mouse can be seen but um, uh, this is the southernmost point of Spain and in here is the, uh, the tiny bit of sea between North Africa and Europe. So this is the Strait of Gibraltar. And, uh, and this is approximately where Hereth is. So it's one of the southernmost uh, regions uh, in, in uh, Europe across 7,000 hectares. And uh, what is, uh, what it, uh, from a climate perspective, we need to uh, point out is that it is a very sunny, nearly 300 days of sunshine in a year. Uh, extremely mild winters because of the moderating impact of the Atlantic sea coast and the very southern uh, location. And uh, there is uh, rain concentrated <clears throat> in the autumn and in the winter, normally brought by the poniente, the westerly humid rain-laden clouds and wind. And uh, the other dominant uh, wind is uh, the dry coming from the east, and that's called the Levante. So it's a sunny, hot summer, dry summer, and concentrated rainfall in the autumn and in the winter, brought by two dominant winds, Poniente and the Levante. 
This is a typical vineyard uh, from Jerez. As you can see, the rolling hills uh, of uh, slopes about 10 to 15 degrees incline. Uh, predominantly chalky soil, Albariza, the primary best quality soil in Jerez. Uh, quality factors that uh, allow the different pagos to be classified depend on the soil type, altitude, exposure to sun, proximity to sea. As such, some pagos or some vineyards have been classified as Jerez Superior, the others fall into the Jerez Zona category. As I have mentioned, the primary soil type in uh, Jerez uh, is uh, the Albariza, which is a white soil, so Alba means uh, white, and it is white because of the very high uh, chalk uh, content, which is, which is practically calcium carbonate. It's very poor uh, uh, in uh, terms of um, uh, organic matter and uh, nitrogen. And the advantage of this soil is that it helps to retain the uh, mature, the moisture, which is of course very rare. We are going to have a look at that uh, in uh, detail in a second. But before we do that, I'd like to point out another two types of soils that uh, can also be uh, found in Jerez. The uh, slightly uh, darker due to sand and clay, uh, the arenas and even uh, darker because of the very high clay, sand, and, uh, uh, and uh, other content, uh, and that is the uh, baros. These are more fertile uh, soil, it needs to be pointed out. In terms of grape varieties, uh, we have uh, three uh, varieties uh, to talk about, Palomino, Pedro Jimenez, and Moscatel. Let us just take them one by one. Palomino is the primary grape variety of uh, the uh, Jerez region and of sherry production. It produces large bunches, very uh, uh, large berry size, normally uh, resulting in, in a pale juice with low alcohol content uh, from, uh, for the wine that is made from it. Whereas Pedro Jimenez is used for sweet wine production with higher sugar content, uh, very, uh, is, uh, has got a thin skin, and uh, therefore it facilitates the sun drying uh, process, the soleo. Moscatel is a very uh, fragrant uh, variety, in, uh, again producing high uh, sugar, so very well suited for sweet wine production. As I have mentioned, the summers are very dry and uh, it's normally in the autumn and the uh, winter that rain uh, falls. So in, instead of having the slopes uh, where, the road, uh, where the water runs down, the, the so-called acerpiados are created and the acerpiados uh, help to retain the uh, moisture um, uh, of the water so that it can soak and, and the arborisa has a good water retention capacity uh, once uh, it managed to soak up the rain. So acerpiados are uh, important for the reten retention of water. Harvest is normally fairly early in August because of the uh, big heat and uh, the uh, picking can be both a, a traditional hand picked or machine harvest is also quite uh, typical. How wine is made in Jerez? So the first uh, we need to focus on the uh, base wine and the base wine is made from Palomino with the white wine making procedure that we have learned about in terms of the fermentation and, uh, and uh, full fermentation is completed. Now at the top of the tank or the barrel, a, a film of floor will develop, which is practically a film of uh, white uh, yeast uh, coverage on top of the liquid. This is the very, very special uh, uh, characteristic of uh, sherry and the Jerez region as this happens. Now sometimes uh, the uh, film of floor is absolutely perfectly sealing the liquid and thereby protects it from oxygen. In this case in the sobre table it will be 45 to 15 percent uh, because uh, if you were to fortify uh, it at a higher uh, percentage of alcoholic strength then the alcohol would kill off this floor. 
if the floor is not completely covering the liquid, so therefore it also allows oxygen to interact with the liquid, then it will be fortified to a higher percentage, and that will be 17%. And this will be quite key to differentiate between what we call the biological aging, where the floor fully covers the um, liquid versus the uh, oxidative aging where oxygen interacts with the uh, wine. And these will translate into styles such as Fino, Manzanilla, Amontillado, Palo Cortado and Doloroso, all of which we'll have a look at in detail in the uh, coming slides. However, before we do that, let us have a look at how sweet wines are produced. The vinification, first of all, starts with the use of either uh, Moscatel or Pedro Jimenez grapes, which are normally very overripe, late harvested grapes. The fermentation will uh, not fully complete because there will be sugar left in the liquid. Obviously, that will be the base for the natural sweet wines. And therefore, the partial fermentation, uh, when it's, uh, uh, we talk about partial fermentation, and we arrest it. So we add the alcohol and we create either a Moscatel or a Pedro Jimenez. Sweetness in sherry, however, may also be achieved through blending a dry sherry with some sweetening agent. So in terms of the dry sherries, you may work either with a Fino Manzanilla, Amontillado, Palo Cortado or Oloroso. And these will be sweetened by the addition of either Pedro Jimenez, which has a really high sugar content, as I had said before, or rectified grape mask. And dependent on whether we use a lighter uh, colored uh, uh, base uh, sherry, we may talk about pale cream, medium cream, or a uh, darker cream sherry. Now, there is this question of floor, and I'd like to have a look at the vinification in a bit more detail. As I said, we uh, start off with making a, a base white wine from uh, fermenting Palomino into uh, the base wine. And um, that is practically the pressing will take place to extract a maximum of 70 liters from 100 kilograms of grapes. And after that, you will be, uh, and, and uh, when, you ex when, you, uh, when you do this uh, extraction, then you need to also bear in mind the differences between the finesse of the liquid so anything that will be the first uh, uh, free run juice is the premier ima, and then the first pressing, the second, and then prensans uh, will be uh, the second pressing. As you press more, of course, you extract more phenolics uh, from the skin, and therefore the finesse of the of the liquid is uh, somewhat uh, decreasing. Alcoholic fermentation takes place. We have uh, learned about that, that practically you've got sugar and then uh, you have got yeast, which converts it into alcohol and produces carbon dioxide, dioxide and heat as well. So you've got your base wine and the base wine is dry, simple, neutral, low alcohol, very unexciting. And the floor will develop spontaneously forming a film on top of the liquid, as you can see in the barrel, which, has, which is on the left-hand side, that this floor is fully covering the liquid in a barrel where the liquid is not completely uh, the same amount as the capacity of the barrel, so there is a bit of space left there. Now, for the floor to develop, which is actually a Saccharomyces uh, yeast, uh, it's, it needs to have certain conditions, and those will be temperature and humidity, which is very uh, unique to uh, Jerez, and that's why uh, it is more, almost only in this part of the world that this uh, floor is uh, known for wines. It protects, as I said, the liquid from oxidation, because if we jump back on the slide, you can see that this floor is fully covering the liquid, so oxygen that is on the top part of the barrel has no chance of interacting with the liquid. And that's why it will protect, uh, will provide a protective layer. And when you uh, want to uh, describe the conditions, then it's an approximately 20 centigrade uh, cellular temperature, 
fairly good humidity, aeration, and less than 16% air quality content, that is the requisite conditions for floor to develop. When you uh, fortify the wine, so you add the grape spirit to it to increase the alcohol level. The, uh, they will be looking at the, uh, um, the quality of the base wine. When it is really pale and light, because the floor is perfectly sealing the liquid, then we talk about a fine wine, so it is a fino. When it is heavier and darker, because the floor is not perfectly sealing the wine and therefore oxidative nature uh, also crops up, this is when we talk about Olorosos. Phenols are fortified to 15% alcoholic strength, Olorosos to about 16 to 18% uh, uh, alcoholic strength. As you will see, there is also a difference in terms of the color. On the left hand side, you will see the phenols and manzanillas with 15% alcoholic strength, pale lemon or pronounced lemon uh, in style. And as you go on to the uh, oxidative aging, you see that it uh, collects a deeper amber, uh, orange, mahogany and, and uh, really dark brown uh, color, the oxidatively aged uh, wines. So how does the life uh, start? We've got the base wine, we have fortified it. And that's when uh, uh, the uh, sherry production starts with entering the sobre table. The sobre table is going to be the first layer in the system of the solera, so the uh, layers, uh, levels of uh, barrels, it enters at the top layer. Uh, and that's the sobre table. Then a second classification will take place to transfer it to the different solera systems. It will depend on uh, what finesse you will find. Let us uh, return to the solera system in a bit more detail. But before we do that, let us also have a look at the first steps of the sweet wine production. As I said, for the sweet, naturally sweet uh, sherries, you will be working with Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez, and these will be uh, dried in the uh, sun uh, and harvested late, so to achieve concentration of sugar and flavor as well. As you can see, sometimes they will be laid out on uh, mats to uh, dry in the sun. So when you create the sweet wines, you will be arresting the fermentation because there is a really high sugar content when you add the, uh, the grape spirit. And then you will be uh, aging uh, the uh, resultant uh, Moscatel or Pedro Jimenez oxidatively. Let us jump back to the Crianza system and how sherries are aged. So first of all, let's uh, think about the barrels because that uh, the barrels have also quite a specific uh, uh, requirements. So uh, the key factors in uh, sherry aging is the use of the 600 liter barrel, which is American, made of American oak. And these barrels will be laid on top of each other into the solera in these almost cathedral-like uh, cellars, which we call the bodegas, as you see, in the middle picture as well, and we'll also pick up on that. However, the 600 liter barrels are not filled uh, completely, but as you will have seen, and you can also see on this slide, it's about 100 liters, so about a sixth of the barrel is left empty, and that's where uh, the floor can uh, develop and plays a role. So let us consider the different uh, layers within the solera system, so the different criaderas, and also how uh, if we actually achieve what we call a fractional blending of wines across vintages as we move the uh, sherry from one criadera to the next. So you have the uh, fortified base wine, which will be classified from the sobre table during a second tasting based on whether it's a fino, so has it retained the uh, floor fully, or has the floor, uh, has the floor not been fully retained and therefore it will be going into an oxidatively aged uh, um, uh, solera system. The solera has level, different levels of, uh, uh, of barrels and, and these are called the criadera. 
Now, the criteria is uh, that the wines are moving from year to year, and practically at the end, uh, what happens is that the sakka, so at the bottling time, wine is taken out and is bottled. So in the lowest level of barrels, there will be empty space. This will be filled up from the first criadera and it will be uh, up to the 500 liters. So now your first level of criadera is somewhat lacking wine. And therefore you will put a, a somewhat a, a year younger wine or part of it in from the second criadera into the first criadera. And if you've got a uh, third, fourth, fifth, then that's how practically the youngest wine is in the highest criadera. So if you've got six in the sixth criadera, and then you move it, uh, you move part of that uh, young wine always down, and then you move again uh, the, um, the next one. So in fact, that is the fractional blending that the part of the young wine is uh, then uh, moved into uh, the uh, second, uh, into the next criadera, and that's how uh, it is, uh, uh, the fractional blending is achieved. This can also, uh, this will also result in the fact that when you have a bottle of Oloroso that is not associated with the vintage, because the Oloroso, uh, as, as, as you have seen from this uh, method of working with the Solera system, uh, it is a blending of different vintages and the vintage loses its significance. It is much more about the house style and the style of the sherry that is important. So I have mentioned uh, very briefly that the, uh, these uh, bodegas or wine cellars are pretty much like cathedrals. Why is that so? The reason is fairly simple. Uh, because uh, heat rises, the only way to achieve the requisite 20 degrees centigrade at the level of the solera is by creating these massive buildings so that we allow the heat to rise. And remember, we are in the southernmost wine region of Europe. So summers may well be 35 to 40 degrees centigrade easily, or uh, sometimes in excess of 40 degrees. So uh, it is through architecture, clever architecture, that the temperature control was achieved uh, and is still achieved today in the bodegas. Uh, there is also uh, the category of the blended sherries to talk about. They used to be hugely important and this was the segment of the share industry that has declined uh, really significantly. But nonetheless, if we add uh, either Pedro Jimenez or rectified grape mass uh, to the various types of shares that we talked about, then you will achieve either a pale cream, a medium, or a, a cream sherry. Let us have a bit more detailed uh, look at the diversity of uh, sherry. So, we talk about dry, sweet, and blended sherries. Dry sherries will be Manzanilla, Pino, and Amontillado. So, uh, sweet will be uh, Oloroso, Palo Cortado, and then the blended uh, sherries Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez. As I said, Pino is always uh, uh, made from Palomino. It is fully protected from oxidation by the uh, film of uh, uh, yeast uh, or floor, and it will have a very pungent, yeasty, doughy uh, uh, character uh, with slight citrus fruit on it, and it's normally about 15-16 degrees percent uh, uh, alcohol, um, tends to be around 15 because of the uh, protection of uh, the yeast. Manzanilla. So San Luca de Barrameda is one, um, one of the uh, areas I have pointed out, and it's on the Atlantic coast. Because of its proximity to the sea, uh, it, has, uh, it results in a slightly salty character, and also it, uh, domin it is dominated by the chamomile uh, uh, in the north. So it, has it is actually a fino wine that comes from San Luca with this very salty, and chamomile character on it, and that's why it is called manzanilla. In fact, the word manzanilla in Spanish means chamomile, so it's fairly easy to remember why we have a fino from San Luca named as 
Manzanilla. Amontillado will be a, a dry part, uh, partially uh, aged with floor, but also the floor is not perfect, so it will have some uh, tiny uh, uh, oxidative aging on it. It is normally a fairly complex and uh, smooth palette because it retains a great amount of finesse, but the oxidative nature is slightly uh, giving it a slight complexity. So that would be an Amontillado. Whereas an Oloroso will be quite deep in color. It has been generously oxidized because there is uh, not a lot of floor left on it. And uh, it, it is a, a four-bodied uh, and normally uh, quite uh, roasted nuts uh, and almonds and orange peel type of uh, flavors and aromas. Palo Cortados are quite exceptional and uh, fine uh, sherries. They are very bright mahogany, so lighter than uh, Olorosos, uh, darker than Amontillados, uh, quite pungent, uh, very good uh, structure, um, and uh, these will be uh, higher in alcohol content. The, three, the uh, sweet wines, Moscatel and uh, Pedro Jimenez, uh, are always oxidatively uh, aged. Moscatel is uh, more fragrant, more flavorsome uh, in terms of uh, more floral uh, notes. Um, and, and it's fairly sweet, uh, two to 300 grams uh, residual sugar. Compared to that, Pedro Jimenez results in almost a double espresso uh, uh, dark uh, wine uh, that is almost black and dark brown with, um, with a kind of uh, cocoa uh, and coffee and, uh, and olive, uh, black and green olive-like uh, flavors, toffee, licorice. It's extremely <clears throat> uh, loaded with sugar. It's about four to 600 grams per liter quite uh, easily. It is a wine that is consumed uh, in very, very small quantities. Uh, a rich, generous, lush, very lovely uh, sweet wine. And then uh, we've got the pale uh, cream, medium and cream, dependent on whether uh, the uh, sweetening agent is uh, blended with a uh, fino or manzanilla or a more of a palo cortado, oloroso or amontillado. And I'm going to fly through the, uh, the, the cream cherries because these would be probably uh, not so relevant anymore. This is a massively decreasing part of the market because it was consumed by a predominantly female uh, group of consumers uh, who tended to be older in the older age group. And with the advance of, of uh, steel wine, uh, this, is, uh, this has taken a backseat really and uh, declined and practically collapsed as part of the sherry market. Uh, in terms of um, uh, fortified wines, uh, the last uh, <clears throat> section of today's uh, uh, virtual classroom will be focusing on vermut. Vermut is practically an aromatized uh, fortified wine and uh, it is produced with the addition of uh, botanicals. Vermut, as we know today, was invented in the 18th century Italy in the city of uh, Turin that it became very fashionable in two main styles, one dry and one sweet. Later other styles were developed and today vermouth remains an important uh, uh, tool in the uh, bartender's or mixologist's toolkit for the preparation of cocktails. Aromatized wines uh, were produced as early on as uh, the Shang and the Western Zhu dynasties in China. There are also scripts from India but the practice that we uh, call as aromatized and vermouth wines today really go back to the 16th century Germany when wormwood, which in German is uh, vermouth, uh, was infused in alcohol for medicinal purposes. So the name in English vermouth uh, comes from vermouth German via French. Uh, that's how it arrived. Vermouth was consumed in England in the 17th century 
but as I said, it was really the Italians in the 18th century who made it very fashionable and was also often consumed as an operative. Being a, uh, an aromatized wine, the expectation uh, in the production process is that you start with a very um, neutral, very uh, uh, indifferent uh, white wine. So therefore the varieties are Claret Blanche, Picopo, um, Catarato, Trebbiano, for example, which are used for the base wine production. It's low alcohol, neutral white wine. And that's why you will be adding botanicals and sweetening agent, as well as then the spirit to fortify it to approximately <clears throat> 16 to 18% alcoholic strength. Sorry. So, in terms of styles of uh, vermouth, we uh, differentiate between uh, three the Italian vermouth, which is pretty much a red colored. Uh, mildly bitter, slightly sweet, also called rosso. Uh, there is a French vermouth, which is normally pale, dry, more bitter than the uh, Italian, and the bitterness is often achieved from nutmeg or bitter orange. Blanco or bianco uh, is a pale, sweeter style of uh, vermouth uh, developed uh, later. In addition to vermouth, there are uh, drinks which are prepared very similarly to vermouths, but uh, these are uh, uh, these uh, the producers prefer not to be uh, labeled as vermouths. So, for example, you may come across Lillet, Saint Raphael, Dubonnet. Vermouths and these aromatized wines are pretty much used for the preparation of cocktails rather than anything else. And therefore, those of you who are very interested in bartending and mixology will come across and possibly work with these. So with this, uh, we've got about 10 minutes uh, remaining from today's session. And I would like to open up the uh, floor to uh, questions as before as well. So I have stopped sharing the screen and would come to you guys if you have uh, sensory questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I have just got uh, one question only, and uh, Tarikul, if you have any other questions, you can just you know say say after this. No, actually, I do not have any uh, no questions. As you have shared the WhatsApp number, possibly we will have all the questions from students. I do not have any, but I enjoyed the session, so I must say that yeah, I I got to know a lot of uh, history about Sherry. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I have just got a one question, which is the what? Uh, what are the factors in uh, Oloroso leads to no flow development? So um, it's it's almost like magic. The the, the question of flow, as I said, it's very unique to Jerez uh, and to shape production in the world, and um, and it is the the condition that the Saccharomyces in the air, the humidity, the temperature. So some barrels will, uh, develop, uh, will develop it perfectly, whereas others won't. Probably because uh, you know, the, there is just difference between barrels. That, that's as simple as that. So therefore, when uh, that fails, then oxidation will take place and, and it will just develop a very different style of uh, sherry. So uh, it's unpredictable really and and you can't say that this barrel will or that barrel will and and you know uh, and that's why the tasting when you create the sobre table and then also the second time you actually need to go and with the um with the copias uh, you need to really go through and do the tasting to be able to see how each barrel has developed okay no, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, that's what the only question I have. Uh, Navan, uh, if you have any any queries, please you can. Mr. Bhagwat. Do we have uh, Goa as well today? Uh... Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Peter. I really enjoyed the session. I was just listening, you know, very curiosity with, and I just I must say that you know I enjoyed the entire session. Uh, as far as the questions are concerned, I'm just waiting from the students yet. Uh, Tarikul sir, are you having any questions? Yes, I do have one. Uh, the question been asked by Aman Shinde, second student from uh, Pune campus. He wants to ask that 
is there any law exist uh, while making vermouth wine making law wine making law like aoc doc docg in italy so is there any law for making vermouth oh for vermouth um it is uh not uh categorized uh, as as such so vermouth is uh you know is a drink that in the world of wine we we don't really talk about because if you like it's a, a concocted wine uh, or a product so from you know a purist perspective uh you you really work with it and it's not the wine that is interesting but it's more the house style the the botanicals that are used so it's um for anyone uh focusing on wines is is something that we we don't really regard as wine wine uh for exactly this reason because it's much more the production that is important rather than the terroir the region so you can get a base wine more or less from anywhere and then mix those with these botanicals thank you thank you yeah that's all for me yeah so guys uh, the students if you have any kind of a questions please you can uh, message me mr tarikul as well as uh, mr navan so that we can uh, speak with uh, we can we can you know show the questions to mr peter to give the answer okay mr peter i have got a question from uh, one of the uh, boy from uh, hyderabad mr rajan mm -hmm. uh that uh, he said that ke, uh, why the grapes are harvesting at late night is there any reason behind that like so uh normally uh if you harvest late at night then you're in a warmer or a hot region and that is uh, to allow the wine uh, the grapes to be brought into the uh, cellar when they are not hot they are cooler so to protect the fruit as well that would be uh one of the reasons why uh night harvest uh, happens okay thank you mr bidder okay guys if you have any questions please ask we have six more minute to go sorry kun share your mail id please in chat box well if uh, uh, I, oh that sorry yeah i, I don't uh, find any questions coming in so uh yeah i was to suggest that if there are no more questions today then uh let's uh finish it it's uh, we are uh, uh four minutes early today but of course uh, other days we were running over so it's a uh, difficult to be bang on time tomorrow uh we are going to continue our journey with fortified wines however we are going to cross across uh from spain to portugal mainland with port and then out onto the islands to madeira and um i really look forward to being back with you guys uh for a session on that uh, enjoy the rest of your days and uh we'll uh, speak tomorrow thank you thank you mr peter okay great take care and uh, see you tomorrow bye bye thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.